Hey there, in this video, we are reviewing the use of functions in a C++ program. So this is gonna cover chapter six of the Gaddis C++ book. Now I gotta say this chapter and the next chapter seven on arrays kind of go together in my mind. Uh, in a programming one course, this represents a pretty big adjustment for my students. And the thing that, that um, is common to both of these chapters is that they provide tools for dealing with much larger programs. When we start off in C++ programming, you're probably making programs of a couple dozen lines or maybe a hundred. But you do have to keep in mind that in professional work, programs are going to be hundreds or thousands or even hundreds of thousands or maybe even like a million lines of code. And you're gonna, and likewise, you're gonna have lots and lots of data. You're gonna have thousands or millions or possibly billions of data points. So a professional programming language like C++ is gonna provide tools to manage and focus that complexity. Um, so here in chapter six, we are dealing with the issue of larger programs with more code. So the solution to that is to divide the program up into smaller subsections that should be manageable to a person that we refer to as functions. And then when we get to chapter seven, that's gonna deal with the issue of more data and how you handle lots and lots of data, the most basic way is an array. But that'll be next time. Let's focus on functions for now. So the idea of a function should be familiar to you from mathematics, right? So a function is a predefined collection of statements to do one specific task in a programming language. A lot like math functions. That's where we get the name. That's where we get the idea. So if you're familiar uh, from with uh, function notation in mathematics, something like f of x equals 2x cubed, right? That's defining a function. And then later on, when you want to actually use it, like for example, if I need to compute f of 2, mentally what I do is I jump into this definition, and if I wrote down f parentheses 2, I can see that the x is being replaced with 2. So as I come into this definition, the x becomes 2. And then I can move to the right-hand side of that function, do the calculations in the order of operations, and as the x becomes 2, I would have to do 2 cubed, which is obviously 8, and then I would multiply by 2 for 16, and then I could come back to the work that I was originally trying to do with the 16. That's really the result of the f of 2 calculation. And that's exactly what happens in a programming language in a computer. When a function is called, the program flow jumps into the function, it executes the given statements, and then it jumps back probably with a return value, with a number which is the answer to that particular function call. The whole point to a function in mathematics is that it has one single result, one single return value, we'd say in programming. And that's exactly what happens in any kind of programming language like C++, is you can return one and only one value. So do keep that in mind. Now my recommendation is that functions should be short enough that they should be one component. You should be able to see them, view them on screen in their entirety from start to finish, should fit on one screen. And I would suggest an ideal of around like seven lines per function. It could be more, it could be less. Um, there's a psychological principle that most people have about seven things that they can store in their short-term memory. So I find that a function that's about that long works really well. People can see it and they can kind of understand it in their brain all at once at one time. So that's kind of, you know, my functions, they might be three or four or five or 10 or 12 lines long but I definitely never have, I really, really try hard never to have my functions be more than one screen. So usually about 15 lines at most is what I go for. I will point out that in other programming languages, um, they're gonna have this concept, but frequently they call them by a different name. So depending on what language you're working in, they might call them functions, they might call them methods, they might call them procedures or subroutines. And for some kind of funny reason, almost every language wants a different name for this but it's one specific section of code that you can look at and understand at once. Okay, so among the big switches that my programming one students need to get used to is at this point in the course, we're asking them to um, engage in modular programming, having your programs not be one monolithic bunch of statements, to be, but to be separate modules that you can look at and think about separately. So this image out of the book here on the left is something you should not do. It says this program has one long, complex main function. It contains all the statements necessary to solve a problem. 
And if you were a programmer and you were gonna engage with that, it would be a real mental challenge to understand and remember all of those statements and all the ways that they interact, right? And, and, and you know, at least halfway through a programming one course and you, you are using a main function all the time, your programs start to look like this. They're getting too long, frankly. So don't do this, right? Rule number one here is you are not allowed to do this anymore. No professional programs look like that. Just never do that. What you do need to do is what you see on the right. This program on the right, the problem, the problem has been divided into smaller problems, each of which is handled by a separate function. So obviously you have a main function has got to be there in C++. And in this particular example, they're showing you three statements. Okay, that's, you know, doable. I normally, you know, don't make it that small, but uh, three statements. And those statements are probably gonna be calling other functions, frankly, right? And you have function two here with a couple of statements, function three with a couple of statements, function four with a couple of statements. And that is what you want to do, right? You do want to have your programs be separated out into separate functions like this. Now, let's think about why that's important for professional programs. Again, number one, the programs are going to be huge. They're going to be thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines long. And there is absolutely no one on earth who ever lived that's able to memorize and understand all the connections in a 100,000 line program. Never mind even bigger than that. So just as human beings in the world, we need to separate these things out into small sections so that we can mentally focus on them and understand what's going on in there. A properly set up function will tell you everything that you need to think about. There'll be nothing outside the function that you mentally need to think about. So it provides a very nice mental focus on the little piece that you're working on today. Secondly, you know, actual programming workplaces, it's not just one person working on the program, it's a whole team. So once you've decided to design your program like this, now you can separate out the work to multiple people. And maybe on one particular day, Alice is working on the main program and Bob is writing function two and Kathy is writing function three and Dennis is writing function four. And that's how you can divide out the labor um, when you're writing a program as a big team. And again, if it's properly structured and it's properly focused, Alice does not need to worry about what Bob, Kathy, and Dennis are doing that day. She doesn't need to memorize their variables. She does not need to worry about what they're doing inside their functions. It's totally separate. And that's what allows us to have a team working and be mentally focused on just one thing that they uh, need to do that day. So that's what we need to do. Do not do that thing on the left. Definitely do this thing on the right. That's what all professional programs look like. Okay, so this is like the yelliest slide that I have in any of my classes that I ever teach. And again, for my programming one students, I need this because there is this switch happening and I really wanna emphasize how incredibly important this is. So well-defined functions, right, that would help you in a workplace, they do one single logical job. Right? You can very quickly explain to somebody, this is the function that gets the score. Right, One logical job that you can summarize very, very quickly for someone to know what it is. They're going to have a clear name, a clear English name. Uh, usually it's a verb phrase. Right, Functions are something that does something. So usually functions should have a verb phrase for a name, maybe like two or three words in the phrase. So good function names would be get score, compute average, find standard deviation, print tax information. Okay, so those are all verb phrases. They start with a verb, and then maybe they're two or three words long, and they're very clear about what they're gonna do. Uh, again, my recommendation is your functions really should fit on one screen. They should be one conceptual unit that you can see on the screen at once from start to finish and kind of mentally understand everything there at once. And ideally around seven lines long, to match up with this psychological principle that that's about people's short-term memory. Okay, again, it's gonna be longer, it's gonna be shorter, that's fine, but kind of target around that number um, I find works really, really well. Remember, uh, the main function is also a function. So all of these principles apply to the main function as well as everything else. Okay, so if you're gonna, when you uh, start uh, introducing uh, other functions to your program, uh, we're assuming you probably already know this again, uh, you're almost certainly going to need function prototypes at the top of your code file to inform the compiler about what kind of functions it will be seeing later on. So the function prototypes are just one line. Uh, 
and they uh, what we call the function signature. And they start with a type, right? Could be int, float, bool, char, could be void, right? If there's no return type. Uh, the name of the function, like we were just talking about, hopefully a two or three word phrase. And then parentheses for the types of the parameters that will be sent into the function as data. Now, in the prototype, you only really need the types of the parameters. You can have int and float and bool and char, whatever you need, right? Uh, you can add identifiers, names, to those parameters if you want, but that's optional. So you can go either way with that. Okay, so then um, when you're actually uh, defining the function, when you're actually implementing it, you're gonna have a header that looks very similar to the prototype, but here you need identifiers for the parameter variables. So once again, you're gonna see the same return type being indicated, the same name of the function, and then parentheses with both the type and an actual identifier, an actual name for each of the parameters that's being sent into the function as the data that it needs to work on. Uh, and then when you actually uh, call it, right, once you've got that set up and you actually call it, uh, you don't need to indicate the return type. The compiler will already know. Uh, just name the function and then pass in the numbers or the variables that you want to copy in for data. Again, you don't need to indicate those types either because the, func the compiler knows from the function prototype what they have to be. So you just name the function and then pass in some numbers or some values um, and then the program will actually jump into the function and actually do that for you. Now, generally speaking, right, again, we want, we want our functions to be, to provide mental focus for the programmers. So generally speaking, functions only have access to data that's passed in by the arguments of the call here, right, those things that are specified in the parentheses. Normally, functions do not have access to any other data, any other variables in the entire system. And that's a good thing because that provides mental focus. If Alice is working on her particular function today, she does not need to memorize or know about the other 10,000 variables in the program. She only needs to focus on the three parameters that were being sent in, if she's got a three parameter function, obviously, right? So that provides a lot of mental focus and you just need to know, you just need to know and understand these two or three parameters coming in and then you can do your work and you are not um, uh, being bogged down by a whole lot of other information that you need to know at that point. I will point out, you probably know that it is possible to get away without that first element on this slide. You can get away without function prototypes if you have actually defined every function before you actually use it. But for larger programs, it's gonna become more and more challenging to um, get them in the right order that uh, you know, function A isn't called in from function D, but function D calls function C and H and J, and it would become a great struggle to order it in the right way that you never call something before it's defined. So uh, the prototypes solve that problem, right? The prototypes at the top of your code file say, here's all the functions you're gonna see, and then you can define them later on, uh, and uh, you don't run into that same problem. So generally speaking, you're almost certainly gonna have prototypes function definitions, and then function calls. Okay, so again, functions only have access to the data that gets passed in by the parameters. They do not have access to anything else. So let's kind of focus on that issue. There's actually two ways that that can possibly happen. The normal way, the default way, is called passing by value. What does that mean? So passing by value is the basic strategy for argument values that they get copied into the function. Right, they actually make a copy of the data into new variables that we call parameters, and they're copied in the same order as the arguments. Okay? Now, you've got to be careful here because these are different variables. You have variables in the calling context, and then you have parameter variables inside the function, and at least they start off as a copy, but they're technically different. So if you change one, you are not going to be changing the other. And I'm trying to be careful here. The technical terminology is that in the outside context, the numbers that are being sent in are called arguments. On the inside context, they're called parameters. Now, I'm sure there are going to be days where I'm not super careful about that, but technically those are the terms. I guess in some other places they call them, I guess, actual parameters versus formal parameters, I think. Um, so there's a couple different ways about talking about that. But the important thing is that you're making a copy of the data. 
So let's say you have this function call here called show sum, and you're calling the show sum function. Again, that's a verb phrase, right, with two words. So I like that. It's passing in three parameters, and apparently maybe in the main function, they've got variables value one, value two, value three, probably entered by the user or something like that. And you call that, and of course it, it jumps control into the actual show sum function. And as that happens, as you jump in, you copy value one into this num one parameter. You copy value two into num two, and you copy value three into num three the way that's set up. And then you do a little something in the show sum function. Now, usually at this point, what I do like with my in-class students is to ask in this picture, how many variables are there? Right, maybe pause the video and just ask yourself, how many variables am I looking at here? And the correct answer is six, right? There's the three value variables over in the main function, the calling context, and then there's the three parameters, num1, num2, num3, that's inside the function. Again, those, the three values are gonna match up with the three numbers, at least when the function starts, because of this pass by value copy job, but they are technically six different locations in memory. So if I am in show sum and I decide to change num1, that will not change value one. They're two different locations, okay? Now again, that's great because it, it provides mental focus. If Bob is working in show sum and Alice is working in the main function and Bob does something crazy and for some reason changes num1, right? Alice doesn't wanna have to deal with that change and she won't because passing by value the value one variable will remain the same. You cannot change that inside the function. So it's a nice separation of the work that Alice is doing versus what Bob is doing. But there is another option, okay, uh, that you might wanna use once in a while. This is called passing by reference and everything that I just said gets turned on its head here. So if you wanna pass a parameter by reference, what you do is you tag it with the ampersand. Um, and the ampersand is basically saying I'm not going to make a copy of this parameter, I'm going to pass in the address of where the parameter is in the main memory system instead. So ampersand indicating really the address. So passing by reference is a strategy in which the function effectively works with the original argument in the call, not a copy, right? And uh, again, uh, you're really passing in, here's where this variable is. And in this, and once that happens, uh, the function in question can change the values in the calling environment because it is directly dealing with the original variable. Why would you want to do this? A couple reasons I can think of. Number one, it saves memory on large data structures. And again, that'll be important like in chapter seven, right? So as we start to work with larger data structures, like maybe a video file, maybe, you know, a music file, it could be several megabytes. If I did the normal thing with pass by value, I'd make a copy of that file in memory every single time I call a function. And so you'd be chewing up, you know, tens, dozens, hundreds of megabytes really unnecessarily. So for a large data structure, it makes sense to pass it in by reference and it's just sitting in one place in memory and the function can now access it. Okay, so you'd save a lot of memory that way. Um, the second reason you might wanna do that is for some reason you need to change the original variable. So if there's a user input function that needs to save stuff, you're probably gonna send in uh, a variable by reference so that this function can actually change it. Doesn't happen a lot, it's not the most common thing. There are a couple of risks of this, right? You're gonna be overwriting the original variable when you do that. Uh, it makes it somewhat harder to track the effects of the function call because I'm doing something in the function, but it's also affecting stuff that's outside the function. So Bob can do this in his function and then it is actually changing the variables that Alice is working on over in her function. So that becomes like a coordination issue. Uh, it may introduce subtle bugs if you don't realize that that's happening in your function call and this function overwrites your data. So you need to make a choice, right? Am I doing pass by value or I do, am I doing pass by reference? So most of the time you should do pass by value because it's safer and it's the normal thing. In these specific circumstances that you're passing a large data structure or you know that this function really does need to change a piece of data, then I would use pass by reference, okay? But I would be very deliberate about that and I would only use it in those two cases where I really need 
to uh, pass a large data or, or change some data. Other than that, stick with the normal thing, pass by value, much safer for everybody. Okay, so that was the issue of like sending information into a function to use. This is the issue of sending information back out, back to the caller. It's called returning data, right? And obviously there's a keyword return in um, C++. You're gonna see that at the end of every main function. You're probably used to seeing that a lot. And you can either say return if it's a void function all by itself, or you can say return and here's a value. Could be a number, could be a variable, could be a whole piece of math sitting there after it, that's fine. So the return statement, when you run into that, jumps you out of the function back to whoever called you, right? Returns control back to the calling context. Now, the return statement is optional in a void function, right? If you make your return type void, you do not need the return statement. That is optional. You could have it in there if you want. Sometimes we do that, but it's optional. Any other kind of function that has any other type of return type, you're going to need it to actually send back that kind of thing. If you have an integer return type function, you've got to have a return statement that sends back an integer, right? If you said float to begin with, you've got to have a return statement sending back a floating point value, right? That makes sense. Um, remember, for those types of functions, you will be sending back one piece of data, right? That's the mathematical definition of a function. For whatever input you have in math, there's only one response, right? There's only one answer to it. That's the point of a function. Uh, so that's exactly what happens in any of these languages like C++. You will be sending back exactly one piece of data with your return statement. And of course, the return value has got to match the type in the function header. If that's a mismatch, the compiler is going to complain about that and say, I don't know which one you wanted. You're going to have to fix that for me. Okay, so let's talk, you know, we've been talking about variables inside a function and outside a function. So let's just review a little bit about the difference between local and global variables, because that's important. So local variables are variables that are defined inside a function. Maybe the main function, maybe one of the other functions, okay? But, but uh, variables defined inside a function are called local. And uh, when you do that, I would say this is the normal thing. Those variables are inaccessible, hidden from other functions. Right? Functions can only um, process, can only access the stuff that was sent in by the parameters normally. So local variables in other functions are not normally accessible. And this is good, right? Again, this is providing mental focus for the multiple programmers on your team working on their different slices of code. So uh, Bob doesn't have to worry about what Alice is using for local variables. Alice has full control over what she wants to do in her function and it will not affect anybody else on the entire team. Um, other functions can use the same name, right? Can use the same name for different variables and different functions. If we didn't do this, Bob would have to go talk to Alice and go, Alice, what are the names of the variables you used? Uh, because I need to name my variables different things, right? That would be a huge hassle. So because of the localization, uh, you can use whatever names you want and there's no way that it's gonna collide or have an accident with somebody else's variables. And those local variables are destroyed when the function ends. They just get wiped out of the memory system, basically. So once the function ends, they do not exist anymore. Keep that in mind. That'll probably be important once in a while. Now, a lot of what I'm saying, I will point out, there are some advanced techniques of like getting around or short-circuiting any of this. So probably across the semester of programming two, anything that I said today, I'll at some point say, here's a crazy way you can, you can get around that and change what I just said. But this is the normal thing, and this is the simplest way to work, and uh, the least amount of complexity if you're working on a team on a big program. Now, on the other hand, there are global variables. Okay, so global variables would be variables defined outside any function. You've probably seen that a couple times at this point, maybe. Now, when you do that, those variables are accessible from any function in scope, from any function from that point down in the code file. They can all access that variable. And that sounds good, and historically at one point, that seemed like that would be a good idea, but over time we've learned that it's not. So when you have a variable that's global and it's way up in the code file, and you've got a long code file and you can't see it anymore, you're gonna wind up forgetting about it. What was the name? Did it exist? I don't even remember anymore, right? So forgetting those variables, um, accidentally changing them someplace that you didn't intend, uh, 
and Alice is using it, but Bob did something different with it in his function that Alice didn't expect, uh, and they don't interact properly, and now the program has a logic error. Um, those are all really common errors. And also there's the issue of masking, because if you have a global variable with one name, and you can make a local variable with the same name, you're gonna get confused about which one you're talking about. I guess that might be a good quiz question, actually. When that happens, uh, you can only access the local variable, and suddenly the global isn't accessible anymore. Yeah. So all these are a real nightmare if you're working on a large program with global variables. So you should definitely avoid global data. For what it's worth, that is a pragmatic programmer. That's the book where we get the do not repeat yourself principle. That's pragmatic programmer tip number 47. Basically, nobody uses global data anymore. Just don't do it, right? Do not make global variables. Now, one thing that we do do is we do sometimes make global constants, right? Because if you make a constant that's global and accessible everywhere, all of these issues that I just talked about don't apply because you can't change them, right? This issue of like Bob changed it and Alice didn't know about it and I forgot something. Well, that's just not an issue because you can't change constants at all. So it is halfway common to make global constants at the top of your program, like a value for pi or the tax rate or the number of hours in the day or something like that. Uh, and you will see global constants a lot in the uh, textbook examples and the labs that we do. So get ready for that, but never, never, never use global variables. Nobody does that, it's a terrible idea. Okay, so you're designing your functions. Here's a little bit of advice from me about um, the best way to do that. Um, if you carefully read uh, book chapter one, it pointed out that most traditional programs go through three phases when they're running. There's an input phase where it's gathering all the data from the user or the hard drive or something like that. There's a middle processing phase where it actually does math calculations. And then there's an output phase where the results get presented to the user or printed out or saved on the hard drive or something like that. Okay, sort of makes sense. So when I'm designing my functions, I try really hard to be disciplined and have my functions serve one of those three phases and not intermix them. Okay, so I think real hard, is this function here, is that supposed to be an input function or is it processing or is it an output function? I, I really try hard not to mix those up in one function. So when you're doing it that way, an input or an output function should not simultaneously do processing, should not be doing math calculations along the way. So as a result, those functions are usually void, right? They're not computing things. There won't be a return value. Um, you're either getting information coming into the system or you're printing stuff with a count statement, right? That's it. So no calculations and those functions are almost always void. On the other hand, a computational function, a processing function that's doing math, doing calculations, should not have I.O., should not have sin or count statements in those functions. That's a different type of job. That's the kind of function that should have a return value. So you take the existing data that was probably sent in by some input, right? Send those by parameters in the function, do your calculations, and then return a value from the calculation. Would not want to have any sin or count statements in a function like that. Okay, so think real hard about that. Try to separate those jobs out and think in advance, is this an input function? Is it a processing function? Is it output? Try to keep those things very separate. And again, the way that I normally design them, my input output uh, functions are all void. And it's the processing functions that have some kind of return value. And I think most of the time, the textbook is doing the same thing. So I agree with it most of the time on that. I think that's good advice. Okay, I think this is the last slide here. So as we're uh, working on larger programs and we are thinking about using our functions wisely, here's two strategies, here's two, here's two kinds of functions you might see, stubs and drivers. Uh, and these are both useful for testing and debugging a program and its logic and its design. So again, a large program, you're not gonna be able to write it all at once. What I usually do is I try to set up my code and write one function and then test that, right? Make sure that's working properly. Then I move on to the next function and I test that, right? And I compile it and I try to see if I can confirm that it's working correctly. If I tried to write a thousand line program and then just compile it the first time, there would be too many errors to deal with. Um, so trying to write a little bit of code and test it and a little bit of code and test it. So 
as we go in that direction, a stub is basically an empty function. It's a function that's got a header and you can call it, but we haven't actually filled in anything for the body yet, basically. So a stub is a dummy function used in place of an actual function. Uh, and this is what gives me my superstructure, right? If, I, if my main function needs to call one, two, three different, different functions, I'm not gonna write them all at once. I will write the headers and just leave them empty, basically. Okay, and then that allows me my main function to call them and then I can compile and then I can start testing, right? And once I have that, then I can fill in the actual job for the first stub and now I have my first actual function. So I tend to just leave them blank, leave them totally empty, or uh, some people uh, put a little message in there that say, hey, you called the compute average function, but we didn't actually write it yet, right? It's sort of a reminder that somebody needs to come back and actually fill in the actual code for that later. Or some people like print out the parameters. You called the compute average function with number one, number two, number three, right? That might be possibly informational. Or you could just leave it blank. But that's what I, that's what I do to get started with um, uh, some functions, just to get the code to compile the first time. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, you can talk about a driver function that is just there to test some other function that already exists. So a function whose purpose is just call something else with some parameters and check to see whether the result is correct or not. Um, so that would pass in various arguments and you know, check or print out or you know, confirm that the return value from those parameters is correct. It's called a driver function. And interestingly, as we develop somewhat more sophisticated programs uh, here in Programming 2, uh, the main function is going to start to look like this. Uh, we're rapidly going to get to the point where we're not super interested in the main function other than how it calls other functions. So you'll see maybe the very first assignment in this course is going to say, write a function that does this particular job. And the book in the, in the assignment description might not even bother to say, well, of course, you're going to have to have a main function and your main function is going to have to call that function you just wrote to get it to work. Right, it won't even bother to say that, but we all know that's gotta happen. So in this context, we're gonna start calling the main function the test driver, right? The whole point there is just call the other functions that we were really interested in. And more and more of our work is gonna look like that. And you're probably gonna see me uh, calling the main function the test driver a lot of the time. Okay, so look for that in our upcoming assignments and labs. All right, so I think that's a pretty good review of uh, Gattis chapter um, six on functions and uh, the kind of different options for sending information in with the parameters, right? You can send it in by pass by value, pass by reference, uh, getting information back with the return statement and some ideas about why are we doing this for larger programs and larger teams so we can have mental focus, just look at that little slice and know that for the next hour, that is the only thing in the entire world that I need to think about is these seven lines and the three parameters coming in and the return value going out, right? So it's a great way of, of uh, giving mental focus. And every programming language has this because you just cannot deal with larger uh, programs without it. So uh, you see the uh, slide here for homework for my students here. And um, if they haven't done it already, they should get uh, the IDE to work on C++ programs like Dev C++ that we use at CUNY Kingsboro. And um, I also have a document on our learning management system on a, the review of code styling, what we expect for names and indentations and um, uh, com use of comments and all such stuff as that. You really gotta read that. Hopefully you know it already. If that's uh, new to you or I'm doing something different than other instructors, you should be aware of how I expect to see our assignments and how I grade them. So that's kind of important. Um, and then the next time that we'd be in person, what I'd probably do at this point is I'd get the Gaddis textbook and I'd probably run some review questions from uh, the end of chapter six, I think would be pretty good for our review. So look forward to that if you're one of my students in class. All right, so uh, that's a pretty good review of uh, chapter six on functions. When we come back next time, remember that'll be chapter seven on arrays that we'll be reviewing. That's how you handle larger blocks of data when you need hundreds or thousands or millions of variables of data. Uh, the most basic thing you can do in any programming language is an array and probably all the programs that we write all semester long are gonna involve arrays. Uh, 
So um, hopefully you can um, be proficient at that, and that probably warrants uh, a video to review arrays before the rest of our course. So I'll look forward to you joining us next time for that.